course a few months later, shortly after starting his first year at Oxford in November of 1911. So he had this um, long-term familiarity with military life, with, with life under canvas in tents, and it lends this easy, similar to, very similar to, to his depictions of life on the open road and military encampments in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Of course, in August of 1914, everything changed. The world turned upside down because of the beginning of World War I. Most of the young men that Tolkien knew at Oxford enlisted right away. His own brother, Hillary, had already enlisted as a bugler when Tolkien returned to Oxford for the fall term. When Ronald completed his degree in 1915, he was assigned to the Lancaster Fusiliers as the second lieutenant. He spent the rest of the year in officer training camps, and in early 1916, he decided to specialize in signaling, which at least had some connection to his interest in languages. The token touches on his training experiences in several of his letters. Writing to his fiancee, Edith, from Oxford in October and November of 1914, he mentions marching in the rain and spending ages cleaning his rifle afterward. In July 1915, he began officer training with the Lancashire Fusiliers and he learned to drill recruits. Later, he attended lectures on what he called the dull backwaters of the art of killing, and he wrote about bomb throwing practice with dummies and dealing with drill in extremes of heat and cold. Tolkien's specialized training in signaling included Morse code, flag and disc signaling, the transmission of messages by heliograph and lamp, the use of signal rockets and field telephones, and even how to carry handle carrier pigeons. Uh, map making seems to have been one of the skills that Tolkien most enjoyed learning, judging by the many maps of Middle Earth on which he lavished so much time and effort. Military life didn't agree with Tolkien. He didn't like the ragtime music many of his fellow officers enjoyed playing on their gramophones, and he found the meals inedible and conditions uncomfortable. As Tolkien admitted in a 1944 letter to his son Christopher, I was not a good officer. He said he spent a good deal of time working on his Elvish languages and histories at meals, during lectures, and even reportedly in dugouts under fire, although later that was kind of, kind of drew back from that and said, no, you can't do that. I think he was exaggerating for a fact when he said that. So Ronald and Edith knew that it was only a matter of time before he was sent to the front, and that it was quite possible he might never come back. So they got married in March of 1916. Three months later, his embarkation orders arrived and his battalion was sent to France. To make matters even more uncomfortable, at some time during the journey to France, all of Tolkien's kit was lost. His carefully selected camp bed, sleeping bag, mattress, spare boots, washstand, everything. It all had to be replaced by begging, borrowing, and buying. An incident which I think is amusingly echoed in his writing many years later when Bilbo sets out from Bag End without even a pocket handkerchief. <laughs> After three weeks, his battalion was sent to the front, marching to the Somme in the pouring rain at the end of June. His company was held in reserve behind the lines at Buzancourt, while A Company trenches on July 6th. On July 14th, two weeks after the commencement of the Battle of the Somme, his company was to release their companions. Tolkien survived a number of occasions, finding that the neat orderly conditions under which he trained had little in common with signaling in the field. And you can see how muddy and uncomfortable the, a, a typical signaling hut would have been. Signaling officers were not expected to participate in much hand-to-hand -hand combat, since their job was to keep communications working at all costs. However, it was by no means a safe job. Uh, one soldier's biography that I read tells of seeing a signaler order to call for reinforcements, and as soon as he raised his flags above the trench, he was cut down by enemy fire. In any case, there was no avoiding what Tolkien called the animal horror of the trenches, the dead bodies in the mud and the craters filled with water and rats. Ronald was fortunate enough to escape severe injury, but two of his closest friends from King Edward's school died in battle. As Tolkien said in the introduction of the second edition of The Lord of the Rings, it seems now often forgotten that to be caught by youth in 1914 was no less hideous an experience than to be involved in 1939 and the following years. By 1918, all but one of my close friends were dead. Of course, uh, John Garth's book on Tolkien and World War I goes into a great deal of detail about uh, the friendship of these four in particular and the other people who were considered members of the TCBS. On October 27, uh, 1916, Tolkien came down with trench fever and was shipped back to England. 
Polk had spent the rest of the war convalescing in various infirmaries and training camps in England, becoming almost well and then succumbing to fever again, until he was finally declared fit for duty just before the war ended in November 1918. During this time, Ronald and Eva's first son, John, was born. The war had a powerful effect on Tolkien's imagination, and it was during this period that Tolkien started writing stories that provided a background for his imaginary languages. Tolkien's close friend and fellow fantasy author C.S. Lewis had a similar experience at the Great War. He too had been a student in Oxford and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Somerset Light Infantry. He was a year behind Tolkien, arriving at the front line trenches at Eros on the eve of his 19th birthday in 1917. Like Tolkien, Lewis lost most of his close friends in the war, including Patty Moore, whose mother he later supported for the rest of her life. Unlike Tolkien, however, he was seriously wounded by shell fire. Some of Lewis's earliest published writings were war poems, and the chapter Guns in Good Company in his autobiography Surprised by Joy covers his war experiences in very little detail whatsoever. He spends much more time on his school experiences um, just prior to the war. But C.S. Lewis wrote in his review of The Lord of the Rings that Tolkien's war has the very quality of the war my generation knew. It is all there, the endless, unintelligible movement, the sinister quiet at the front when everything is now ready, the flying civilians, the lively, vivid friendships, the background of something like despair and the merry foreground, and such heaven-sent windfalls as a cache of choice tobacco salvaged from a ruin. Tolkien, on the other hand, wrote little directly about the war, although he did explicitly acknowledge his debt to his war experiences in several places. He once commented, my Sam Gamgee is indeed a reflection of the English soldier, of the privates and batmen that I knew in the 1914 war and recognized as so far superior to myself. A batman was a, uh, a personal body servant to an officer to take care of his uniform, money earnings, and that sort of thing. Um, in a 1960 letter, Tolkien wrote, the dead marshes and the Norman owe something to northern France after the Battle of the Somme. The dead faces floating just below the surface of the water were a standard image in great war memoirs and fiction. And in On Fairy Stories, Tolkien says, a taste for fairy stories was wakened by philology on the threshold of manhood and quickened to full life by war. It shows he was already thinking in terms of expressing himself through the means of the fairy tale. Tolkien was predisposed to fit his war experiences into this framework from the start, rather than into the realistic and ironic form that many other writers used. Tolkien came out of the war with a profound sense of respect for the courage of the ordinary soldier and a deep understanding of the effects of the stress of war on the human soul. His short play, The Homecoming of Bjorn Bjorkholm's Son, is important for understanding the development of Tolkien's ideas of courage and military leadership. Published in 1953, but written in 1945 or earlier, it is a dramatic verse play expanding on an episode from the Anglo-Saxon poem, The Battle of Malden. In it, two men, the young son of a bard and an old farmer, debate the courage and deeds of Bjornroth, whose dead body they seek at night on the battlefield where he fell. Bjornroth uh, allowed the Viking invaders to come across the causeway, which you can see in this uh, picture over here. Um, at, at low tide, this would have been of land that they could cross. Um, but he allowed the Viking invaders to come across the causeway that he was pledged to defend, just so the battle would be a mightier matter for song. Tolkien sees far more honor in the conduct of Bjorknot's men than their leader. Their part was to endure and die and not to question. It is the heroism of obedience and love, not of pride or wilfulness, that is the most heroic and the most moving. War made its presence known in some way in almost every work by Tolkien. Tolkien's first known prose writing after his experience on the battlefields of northern France, The Fall of Gondolin, is full of extended and terrifying scenes of battle. Some elements of The Fall of Gondolin seem to echo World War I. For example, the enemy uses hollow metallic monsters carrying orcs inside, which sound very much like the tanks that first took the field at the Somme in September of 1916, while Tolkien was still on active duty. War even intruded into the charmingly illustrated Father Christmas letters Tolkien wrote for his children every year from 1920 through 1943. Perhaps not unexpectedly, as the children must have been concerned about the news of the world. I am so glad you did not forget to write to me again this year, Father Christmas says. 
The number of children who keep up with me seems to be getting smaller. I expect it is because of this horrible war. At present, so terribly many people have lost their homes or have left them. Half the world seems to be in the wrong place. The last letter, written in 1943 to Priscilla, comments that my messengers tell me that people call it grim this year. I think they mean miserable, and so it is, I hear, in very many places where I was especially fond of going. Tolkien wrote much of the Lord of Rings during World War II, but he insisted that little or nothing in it was modified by the war that began in 1939 or its sequels. The real war does not resemble the legendary war in its process or its conclusion. However, there are themes throughout the work that reflect his perspective as a veteran of an earlier war, and there are plot elements that reveal the attention he paid to world events as he wrote. As he admits later in the foreword, an author cannot remain wholly unaffected by his experience. Tolkien's perspective as a veteran gave him an outlook on World War II not shared by most of the young men and women then enlisting. We can see some of his insights on the retrospective fertility of World War I in a speech by Elrond who remembers the last great battle with Sauron in the years between the wars. Sauron was diminished, but not destroyed. His ring was lost, but not unmade. The dark tower was broken, but its foundations were not removed. In Frodo's plaintive words, I wish it need not have happened in my time, there's an echo of Tolkien's own feeling of darkening horizons. There is one aspect of The Lord of the Rings that sets it apart from Tolkien's pre-war writing and shows the influence of World War II in a somewhat unexpected way. During this war, Tolkien was not just a veteran and an active participant in homeland defense efforts, but he was also the parent of two combatants. Michael became an anti-aircraft gunner and saw active duty defending aerodromes in Britain and France. Christopher joined the Royal Air Force and was sent to South Africa to train as a fighter pilot. Tolkien's eldest son, John, the god in the armed forces, was trained for the priesthood in Rome and had to be evacuated from Italy shortly before the war broke out. All of this gave Tolkien an additional perspective on war to explore in his writing. It is not World War II itself, but the new and personal experience of being an anxious parent of grown children in active military service that gives his writing on war an added poignancy. Losing a parent was sadly familiar to the orphan Tolkien, but the possibility of losing a child was something frighteningly new and different. In fact, in one letter to Christopher, he very, very pointedly comments that too many of the leaders of the war are childless and view the war from a safe vantage point in their large motor cars. All of his letters to Christopher and Michael are full of a tender concern for their physical and spiritual safety and a longing to be able to share their danger. In the pre-World War II Hobbit, there are no actual parent-child pairs. There was no global war going on during its writing, and the thought of his own children ever serving in the military was probably not uppermost in Tolkien's mind. The Shire is a peaceful country, and war is part of the distant past. Swords in these parts are mostly blunt, and axes are used for trees, and shields as cradles or dish covers. Children never seem to die before their parents. However, there are many parent-child pairs in the Lord of the Rings, and Tolkien explores a variety of parental reactions to the risks their children run in war. Consciously or not, Tolkien may have been examining all the ramifications of his possible reactions to what could happen to Michael and Christopher, and what might have happened to Priscilla if she could have served in combat, or to John if he hadn't left Rome in time. One of the grimmest lessons the Lord of the Rings teaches about war is that some of the mental wounds it causes never heal in this world. Frodo is Tolkien's prime example of the potential heartbreaking effects of war on the mind. What Tolkien showed Frodo going through after his return to Hobbiton bears a strong resemblance to post-traumatic stress disorder. During World War I, military doctors suddenly began to notice a large number of cases of men suffering from war stress, which they called shell shock. Many of its symptoms sound like an effect, the effect of the black breath of the Nazgul, or like Frodo's sufferings after the attack with the Morgul blade on Weathertop. Many of these doctors first thought that shell shock was a failure of manly courage. Some grew to have a more sympathetic outlook after experiencing conditions at the front themselves. The very definition of courage was revised by the war and the phenomenon of shell shock, from physical heroism to stoical endurance. And this is why Tolkien chose to show us traditional heroism in battle on the one hand, through characters like Aragorn and Faramir, 
but make it clear that what Frodo and Sam were doing and enduring was so much more important. This may help explain why Frodo is the only character who exhibits such a strong delayed reaction to his experiences. Frodo's experience of the war was different from everyone else's, and more akin to modern war in its unrelieved stress. After entering Mordor, he was in effect threatened continuously by an invisible enemy for ten days and nights without relief, and in fact his sense of being under the constant observation of an unseen enemy dates back to the moment he put the ring on on Ammon Hen. All the other characters experienced a more traditional pattern of war, with battles lasting a day and a night at most, and divided in space and time from other confrontations. Frodo chose to keep his pain hidden, writing about his experiences in the Red Book he leaves to Sam, but not talking to anyone directly about what he went through. What Frodo says in the end, as he leaves Middle Earth to find rest in the Elven Lands, is, I tried to save the Shire, and it has been saved, but not for me. It must often be so when things are in danger. Someone has to give them up so that others may keep them. Tolkien's fiction, criticism, and letters make it clear that he greatly desired peace, but on the other hand felt that war was sometimes necessary, despite his disgust with modern military means. Tolkien was not a pacifist in the political sense, that is, in the sense of using pacifism as a moral tool to affect nonviolent political change. He did not appear to agree with pacifists that their philosophy would ensure peace. Tom Bombadil lives a life of pure pacifism, but his existence at any time might depend entirely on the efforts of those willing to defend him. And in fact, he gives the hobbits blades, he gives them uh, weapons. Further's rejection of the use of violence during the scouring of the Shire is shown to be admirable but impractical, as the success of Mary and Pippin's methods demonstrate. Eowyn's response to the pacifistic philosophy of the Warden of the Houses of Healing is more convincingly written than their sudden conversion a few pages later, and needs but one foe to breed a war, not two, Master Warden, and those who have not swords can still die upon them. But it's also clear that Tolkien did not see war as a splendid thing in and of itself. While Tolkien regarded war as something which, on occasion, was unavoidable, he did not glorify war as such. Although there are glorious moments during the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, they are more than balanced by other passages on the evils of war. He was certainly well aware of the shortcomings of modern warfare in particular, and of the dangers of too much pride and military valor. The whole subject of whether or not the Allies could use the ring against Sauron is a major issue that demonstrates Tolkien's thinking on war. Even the strongest and most moral person who tried to use the ring would find that he or she was not strong enough to refrain from the temptation to unjustly enslave the rest of the world. Aragorn and Faramir, for example, see the moral dangers of using the ring very clearly from the start and refuse to take it. Those who desire peace above all else are tempted by the ring's power to allow them to impose their will on the world for good purpose. But the wise, like Gandalf and Galadriel and even Sam, see the trap of power for what it is. Only those who can remove themselves entirely from wanting to influence the outside world, like Pa Mondadil in his private retreat, are completely unaffected by the ring. Tolkien warns us against the concentration of power and the will to dominate. Sauron, Saruman, and the ring itself illustrate a soul-destroying addiction to the power of controlling others. In his writing about war, Tolkien also reminds us of the new catastrophic nature of mercy, that transcending the hard rules of war and freely offering mercy and pity to an enemy is an act of grace that may rebound in unexpected ways and turn the tide of events. Tolkien stated in one of his letters that if he was like any character in the books, it was Faramir. It is these words spoken by Faramir to Frodo in the woods of Athelion that best express the essence of Tolkien's philosophy of war. War must be, while we defend our lives against the destroyer who would devour us all. But I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend. I've always been struck by something else that uh, Tolkien has uh, far to say to Frodo, and then he says himself to Christopher in the letter about 
you know, if ever I get to see you again, you know, before that day, it's striking how much he uh, related his, his own experiences to, uh, to what goes on. That's interesting. I don't think I've noticed that before, but yeah. that's true. It's, like, yeah. it's a Faramir's uh, party work with Frodo, or just before his party work with Frodo. We'll yeah. tell each other. I don't. I don't look forward to ever seeing you again. But we'll tell each other the tale, hopefully, on some someday afterwards. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and he does also draw on his fiction elsewhere when writing to Christopher, talking about um, that, that there were orcs on both sides. Um, when he's saying that yes, the real world is not as cut and dry as Middle Earth. There are orcs on both sides. Yeah. Um, I think I did read this was just I think a comment on an article, but um, one psychiatrist said in these focus letters, um, you see a pattern of he gets very um, burglarous and. To be his every man and to, to be that, that voice that says the people on the other side are people, mm -hmm. and that's uh, something that has to be kept in mind. Yeah, I, th I think that's uh, I think that is something we see, um, yeah, other places as well, but in particularly in that moment. And, and you know, Tolkien has said, I, I think there was something in one of the letters I have no beef with the German people, mm -hmm. I you know, that's where my ancestry is. It's, it's that really little ignorant of. Ignoramus Hitler, I think, is what he says. Mm -hmm. Yeah. on the evil side are not really alliances. They're forced. They're, uh, there's, a, there's a historical, historically uh, Mordor conquered uh, the Heritage and, and you know, the other realms to the south. So it's more um, not an, in, an alliance of independent equals. Whereas on the side of the allies, yes, these are independent equals. They all have their own um, their own agendas, their own ways of thinking, and it's really a, a tribute to their ability to work together to see this alliance actually, yes, coming together and everything, um, in spite of historical differences like the dwarves and the elves and so on. So um, I, I think he's very realistic in showing that an unforced alliance 
between equals is not an easy thing to do, but it is definitely well worth it to, to seek after. Whereas the kind of alliance that Mordor has, it falls apart. You know, Sauron dies, and the, the Southerners are like, oh, what do we do now? So, yeah. Yes? Do you think Tolkien's experience 